You know, many GOP candidates viewed unfavorably this year, highlighting the challenge of the party, um, trying to attract immigrant voter supporters um, among this rhetoric that's actually um, being provided. So also on congressional races, uh, this is where you also have a, a great opportunity where the Democrats hold nearly a two to one advantage over Republicans in the Senate races. Uh, but once again, I really want to push upon you, all of you, but that means that you really need to make sure that your Senate campaigns understand that it's important to engage with this particular community. Uh, the, also, the Democratic advantage is even greater in House races as well, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. One other thing I wanted to highlight is about young Asian Americans ages 18 to 34 is really a key demographic for us to watch on. So this was, a, um, like I said, a survey that was conducted this uh, past spring in six, with six largest national origins and done in language. So with that, I want to focus on the um, party favorability. As you can see right here, Democratic Party has a 64% uh, favorable um, favorability in, in itself. Um, also, in regards to the um, oops, Senate and House races, we really wanted to focus, as I had noted earlier, that um, the Democratic candidates of any uh, Senate race have a um, favorability of 49%, that they were most likely would choose the Democratic uh, voter. But at the same time, if you look at the ethnic breakdowns, there are some variety, uh, varieties where, you know, 34% of Filipino Americans still don't know, right? So that means there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. 28% of Chinese Americans don't know who they'll vote for on the Senate. Right, so when um, campaigns are looking for uh, votes to pick up, they need to go ahead and focus on the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Also in the House generic ballot, right, even though 54% um, say that they would vote for a Democrat, you still see, once again, some variety in terms of the ethnic breakdown. 28% of Chinese don't know, um, you have 25% of Korean Americans who don't know, all of this data is actually on our website, um, and so you could look at this because I know I'm breezing through this very quickly. Um, we also asked specifically a couple questions about the reaction against exclusionary rhetoric. Um, what would be your reaction if you saw a candidate that had anti-immigrant rhetoric among Asian American uh, registered voters? They said 40% will actually vote for someone else. It's such an important issue that uh, they would actually change that because of what's been happening. Uh, we also followed up with what would be um, their reaction to anti-Muslim rhetoric. And also 43% said that they would also change their vote if that was to happen as well. So in terms of the issues, uh, we're, everyone's asking like, well, how do we engage this electorate? What are the issues that we talk about? Well, education, healthcare, the threat of terrorist, terrorist attacks, and the jobs and economy continue to be the top issues for our particular community. So this is really important because Asian American Pacific Islanders, they typically don't um, label themselves as progressives or conservatives or Democrats or Republicans. It's really about how, they, how the candidate stands on a particular issue. So really to gain their vote and to engage with them, you really need to focus on their interests in that way. And um, these are, we actually drilled down a little bit more in terms of their views of party advantage on issues. So the Democrats are doing really well, but in terms of taxes and the threat of terrorist attacks, this is where uh, there needs to be a lot more work um, in, in regards to those particular issues in itself. So that actually provides a quick highlight for you. Um, so that way, you could, like I said, you could drill down a lot more into this. But uh, since we landed on the, the particular issues, I want to go ahead and turn our attention to our next speaker, which is Greg Sandano, who is the Executive Director for the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. He'll be talking a little bit more about some of the issues that they've been working on and some of the lessons learned and findings that uh, they have discovered as well.
Great. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Woo! Well, thank you to uh, folks in Philly, especially all the local groups here, for welcoming us. I'm um, really excited to be here and to be here for the convention this week. Um, as Christine mentioned, my name is Gregory Sandana. I'm with the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance and the Institute for Asian Pacific American Leadership and Advancement. Um, There you go. There you go. So just, I'm just going to quickly uh, go over Apollo and I Apollo and particularly drill down on APIs in the workforce and some information on criminal justice and the importance of criminal justice reform to the API community. So Apollo, founded in 1992, is the first and only organization of API union members and our allies. I wanted to give actually a special shout out. One of our founding members is here sitting in the front row, Ms. Louisa Blue. She was actually recently elected as executive vice president of the Service Employees International Union, making her the first, the highest API of that union, one of the highest in the entire labor movement. So I wanted to congratulate her and um, thank her for, for her continued support. Um, in 2011, we founded our uh, sister C3 organization, IAPALA. And our four programmatic priorities, um, year-round civic engagement, racial justice, and ending mass criminalization, organizing and leadership development, and global solidarity and corporate accountability. So to dive right in into APIs in the workforce, um, as we talked, to, as um, Christine mentioned, APIs are the fastest growing racial group in the country. I um, mean, that's also the case um, in terms of the racial segment in the labor market. Um, and APIs are involved in all parts of the workforce and are, you know, small business owners to farmers and, and everything in between. As you'll see here, the API civil um, labor force grew 61%, um, so from 5.5 million to 8.8 .8 million between 1994 and 2014. Um, over the next decade, it is projected to grow another 23% to 10.8 million and even higher by 2040. Um, other things to, to note, the API labor force is bifurcated, um, meaning we have, are overrepresented both at the higher and the lower end of the labor market, and that the, um, there's also a rise in the distribution of the, of the labor market. So we're now in highly dense cities, but also in rural areas, particularly refugees. And so um, one thing that we also wanted to know is that through the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we see kind of unionization numbers. And while those numbers are actually going down for most communities, there's actually been an increase in, for the API community. So API unionization grew from 9.4% in 2013 to 10.4% in 2014, an increase of about 96,000 workers. And a higher percentage of API women were unionized, 11.3% um, than women, the women workers overall, which is at 10.7%. And in particular, we also saw that um, API communities benefited from unionization. Um, so on average, unionization raises the API workers' wages by 9%, or about $2 per hour. Um, and API workers in unions are also 19% more likely to have health insurance, and 25% more likely to have a pension plan um, than their non-union counterparts. And then in particular, the, the benefits are, are um, even higher for API workers in typically low-wage occupations. So for API workers in low-wage occupations, unionization um, raises wages by 12%, and unionization for API workers in low-wage occupations are 25% more likely to have health insurance and 31% more likely to have a pension. So criminal justice, and so uh, there's been a lot more conversation recently on criminal justice, and this is, um, we felt it was important to kind of talk about this in the context of the API community. Um, APIs are officially recognized as others throughout much of the prison system, um, and which is somewhat fitting in the sense that the population is often overlooked, and so this is why we wanted to really make sure people understood um, what's at stake here. Um, in 2013, there were 118,000 others in the state and federal prison system, or composing about 9%. Um, for API specifically, the prison population um, grew 250% during the prison boom of the 90s. Um, during that same time, Asian juveniles in California were 
more than twice as likely to be tried as adults as compared to the white juveniles for similar crimes. Um, arrests for API youth in the United States increased 726% from 1977 to 1997. I mean, in cities such as Oakland, um, API youth had had very high arrest rates. So for example, Samoans um, were uh, with 140 per 1,000, which, which is actually the highest in Oakland. Um, Cambodians with 63 per 1,000, and Laotians with 52 per 1,000. So as you can see, there's a disproportionate impact on Southeast Asians and Pacific Islanders. So um, this work actually led to a couple of exciting things. One, last year in June, Apollo with a, with a coalition of other organizations um, helped host, host a convening at the San Quentin State Prison along with the Asian Prisoner Support Committee and uh, their program inside the prison called Roots, Restoring Our Original True Selves. Um, and we're actually going to be hosting with another set of groups a convening in Seattle next month with our partner there, Fight, formerly incarcerated group Healing Together. In particular, the report I want to just um, share with you all um, is called APIs um, Behind Bars, Exposing the School to Prison to Deportation Pipeline. Um, you can find it um, at that link, a bit.ly um, backslash APIs Behind Bars. And the co-authors of this group are Asian, are Asian Americans in Dancing Justice Los Angeles, APALA, the Asian Prisoner Support Committee, the National Education Association, and the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. Um, so we're actually moving, to, after this, that report was released, we actually moved into the next phase of our work, which is called APIs Beyond Bars. Beyond Bars. And we're actually looking at policies in these particular areas, prevention, sentencing, incarceration, deportation, and reentry. Um, and um, I'm proud to say that we, we actually grew the working group from those five initial groups and now um, have an epic, empowering Pacific Honors communities and also the One Love Movement. And I see my brother Narin here representing as well. So we're excited to be working with them to host that convening next month um, in Seattle, Washington. So thank you so much, y'all. We appreciate, appreciate your time. And I have some um, handouts in here when I will we'll pass that in with you. Now let's welcome Christine Chen back up. of issues and how um, we can actually be of assistance to you. We have Chris Kang, who's the National Director for the National Coalition of Asian and Pacific Americans. Come on up, Chris. Good afternoon. Thanks so much, uh, Christine and APIA both, for having me here uh, to talk a little bit about the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander priorities. Uh, I do not have a fancy PowerPoint, um, but in just a few weeks we will. Uh, I am the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. We're a coalition of 35 national Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander organizations. Uh, including APIA Vote, including Apala, including Advancing Justice, AJC, where you will hear from their Executive Director and President Mimua after me. Uh, and what we strive to do is to provide a bigger platform for all of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities to really have their voices heard, whether it's in the halls of Congress, within the administration, or in the media, to really make clear uh, that we are a growing, uh, a growing population, that our votes matter, that our voices matter, and that we really need to, um, to have that seat at the table. And so what ANCAPA does every four years is provide a platform of the priorities and issues that we're working on and that reflect the great diversity of needs and concerns for the AA and HPI community. Uh, and some of them really are cross-cutting. There are things that um, may not uh, usually hit the spotlight uh, when you're talking about top priorities, but uh, I do want to mention a couple of them uh, that are really overarching. The first one is data disaggregation, which um, actually uh, President Obama came to speak to the Asian Pacific Islander APEX uh, Institute for Congressional Studies. And, uh, and he mentioned the need for data disaggregation and actually got a, a round of applause, a standing ovation for that. And the reason for that is that it's so important that our elected officials and our members of Congress and our policymakers all understand 
that Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders are not one monolithic community. We, in fact, represent uh, nearly 50 different ethnicities, and that we have a lot of different needs and concerns. And I think that Greg just went through some of the different ways that criminal justice reform, for example, hits different segments of our community. And it's important as we work toward combating the model minority myth that people understand that you can take a top level average of the median income for Asian Americans or the average amount of educational attainment, and you can think that our community has, uh, has made it, so to speak. But that doesn't actually look at the broad range of needs and concerns and priorities that our broader Asian American Pacific Islander community has. And so it's so important for us to have data disaggregation, whether it's in healthcare, learning what the health disparities are, whether it's in education, understanding where different educational disparities are, uh, business, housing, you name it. We need to know where the Asian American community is, not just as a whole, but individual communities, so we can really have a government and public policy that really speaks to us and speaks specifically to our needs and our priorities and concerns. Uh, the other thing that's very uh, wide-ranging and, and cross-cutting is language access. Our communities, depending on the count, speak somewhere between uh, 100 and 300 different languages. Uh, and while we don't expect the federal government to translate every single piece of paper into 300 languages, uh, they have to make an effort where, where um, critical rights are involved, such as health care access, such as voting rights, such as other government programs, so that um, people, when one third of the AAPI community is limited English proficient, uh, they understand what their rights are, what their, what their obligations are, and what benefits they might receive through the government. And so we want to make sure that data disaggregation and language access in particular are things that are cross-cutting throughout the government. Uh, the other thing that we're working on that's very big picture uh, is racial justice. And I know that uh, Christine touched on this a little bit uh, with respect to the poll that API Vote, AJC, and API, API Data did. Uh, but we're in a time now of, of growing division, uh, growing exclusion, growing rhetoric that may target our communities uh, in a way that is harmful both for the rhetoric, for the people involved, but then leads to negative public policy. When you have a, a dialogue that is focused on dividing us, that is focused on walls that divide us, or banning people because of a specific religion or race, uh, that's going to lead to really disastrous public policy down the line. And so the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, one of its top priorities this year is standing up to the xenophobic, bigoted, anti-Muslim hate. And making sure that people understand that in part it's because we have a history of experience of being excluded going back to the Page Act and the, the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1800s to the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II to the profiling of, of many of MEMSA communities, South Asian Muslims, uh, Arab and Sikh Americans after 9-11. Uh, we have a history of this, so it's our responsibility to stand up. Um, but also, we have a responsibility as Americans to stand up and to stand together. And the other place where Encampla is making its voice known is to stand up in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Thank you. I think this is another place where uh, Black Lives Matter and the debate around affirmative action are places where, quite frankly, um, some people seek to divide us, to divide uh, communities of color and use us as a wedge in this debate to their own benefit. Uh, and it's up to us to stand up uh, to stand up for other communities of color, to stand up for ourselves, and to really be part of this broader racial and social justice movement. Uh, and so those are some of the bigger priorities that our campus has, has been working on and will continue to work on over the next six months. Uh, the other thing that we've continued to do, uh, as you well know, is that the range of issues that affect the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community is vast. And so, as this platform is unveiled at the APIA Vote Town Hall, you'll see us talking about things like immigration. Of course, we support uh, comprehensive immigration reform. We also continue to support the President's executive actions around uh, expanding the deferred action for childhood arrivals and in creating a new program for parents of people who are in those situations such that we can actually help 400,000 Asian Americans who currently are continuing to live 
uh, in the shadows in fear of being deported uh, because the Supreme Court only has eight justices and is not able to reach a decision. We're continuing to work uh, with the Department of Homeland Security and others to make sure that with respect to immigration enforcement, there isn't profiling based on religion, race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Uh, we're also focusing on education and making sure that there's educational equity, making sure that the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act that was just reauthorized, it's now called the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, provides, again, this disaggregated data so we understand the needs of our, uh, in particular, our elementary, middle school, and high school students uh, as they go through. But then also sort of looking to the next big education debate in Congress, which will be around the reauthorizing the Higher Education Act. And again, understanding that just because, on average, Asian Americans have a high uh, rate of attainment for a bachelor's degree. Uh, as you look out in between uh, different ethnicities, and this is also especially true in the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, uh, we're not all reaching that same level. And we really need to make sure that all Americans have that chance for a fair shot at an equal quality education from kindergarten all the way through higher education. Uh, we're also working on health care to make sure that the gains of the Affordable Care Act are are protected, but also that healthcare access is available to all people, uh, and as many people as possible, regardless of their immigration status. We're also working on civil rights, uh, and I'll sort of close on this, because I think that this is a good uh, transition to the next speaker. Uh, but civil rights, the big issues that we're focusing on here are around voting rights, which is gonna be incredibly important as we come up to this election. This will be the first election in 50 years to not have the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. And we're trying to make sure that, uh, in particular, people who have limited English proficiency have the ability to receive in-language materials, uh, voting materials, and also they understand their rights, their right by law, to bring somebody with them to the polls to vote. Uh, the other thing that we're working on that doesn't always feel like a civil rights issue is the census. Uh, and the census is another big issue in terms of making sure that our community is counted. Uh, because it comes from that counting that, one, there's a lot of data uh, that will be used to determine where government programs work, uh, but also sort of to make sure that all of the counting is done and as much outreach is done in language as possible. Because again, uh, a third of our community is limited English proficient, and we need to make sure that um, that if we are that we're counted, because uh, if we don't, if we're not counted through the census, then we don't count uh, when it comes to these government programs and priorities. Uh, the other thing that we're working on that uh, I think of as a civil rights issue is gun control. Uh, this is a new area that we're working in uh, to make sure that that there are fewer guns out there, that there are universal background checks. Uh, that assault weapons are taken off the street and really adding the Asian American perspective to this. Uh, and I'll say that, uh, I'll say one reason we're doing this is not only because we know that it's the right thing, uh, but because the data shows that this is an issue that's incredibly important to the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. That not only is it that four out of five Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders support stronger gun control, but that it's also one of the top issues. And so we need to make sure that our voice and our, our voice is at the table and that people understand where our community is coming from and why it's an issue of concern. And so as we come up with all of these issues in the Encapo platform, uh, it's great to have them all and, and uh, you should check out our website is uh, in NCAPA, N -C -A -P -A, online org, and that'll be coming out in a few weeks. Uh, but then the question really is, so you have all of these issues what do you do with it? And how do you hold people accountable? And how do you really make sure that, that other folks know what your, your issues are and, and sort of you know what their positions are with respect to your issue? And so I know that that's something that, that Bimu is going to talk about, the terrific work that AJC is doing in that regard, to really make sure that these aren't just issues and positions, but that we really then take it to the next most important step, which is to make sure that we're holding our elected officials and candidates accountable. So. Uh, with that, thank you again, Christine, for the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about the work uh, and the priorities that Encamp is focused on. So our next speaker is Mia Moa as President and Executive Director for Asian Americans for Advancing Justice, AJC. We'll be talking a little bit about 
uh, some of the tools that you can uh, be utilizing to educate the API voters. Uh, me is actually a longtime friend. She, of all people, knows and understands the importance of the power of the Asian American Pacific, Pacific Islander vote. Uh, formerly as an elected official in Minnesota, um, really the Hmong vote really helped what she was able to do and capture that vote. Um, was really able to transform the politics in Minnesota. Me come on up. Thank you. Woo! So you guys, I, I can't let Christine exit from the stage. No one introduced her, right? Because we all assume that everybody knows who she is. And everybody do know who she is, except that I, I feel like I need to brag a little bit about my sister here. Um, I mean, we've been through a lot of conventions together, both Democratic conventions and Republican conventions. Um, and Christine and API vote is there every single time. It's a lot of hard work to make something like this happen for the community. And so I want all of us to shout and to do a roaring round of applause. To say Amazing. Amazing. She's just amazing. And exactly how many hours of sleep she's gotten in the last week, in fact in the last month. And I don't know that she'll be getting much sleep between now and the presidential town hall uh, in a couple of two, three weeks. So uh, she is amazing. Uh, I am so proud uh, to be a partner with API Vote. Um, Advancing Justice AJC and API Vote have been doing our um, Asian American Voter Survey uh, for the, this is our third year. This is our third year. Uh, it's been an amazing partnership. But in addition to the partnership with API Vote and the Voter Survey, um, we are really proud to be working, and I know that Christine talked a little bit about this, um, with a host of uh, national as well as local organizations, Asian American nonprofits through our C3 work across the country, across the country to put in place a national civic engagement strategy, a national civic engagement strategy to ensure that not only in this presidential cycle, but every single year, we make the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander vote a priority. So yes, and it's been amazing, and I think it's gonna happen, and I think API vote has been, uh, you know, one of our leading national partners in that, but there are countless um, community organizations across the country that have been part of that national strategy. And I feel very confident and really proud that we're going to make that happen, not only this year, but every single year moving forward. So in the spirit of that partnership and to support that partnership, I want to talk a little bit about a project that we are putting together. Um, that comes off of the uh, uh, survey, the voter survey that Christine talked about earlier. You know, she talked about sharing with you all the statistics that we have been working really hard to make sure we get into the hands of all of the political parties, as well as mainstream candidates, as well as out to the press, and out to you all, right, about who Asian American voters are, where we stand, and what do we expect from candidates and political parties. And we have always said that anybody who ignores our community does so at their own peril. Because as you will see from the statistics that's available in the report, is that our community is standing at the cusp of being a political force wherever we're at. And so in addition to the political um, information about how Asian Americans um, are showing up, making visible the exercise of our franchise, Christine also talked about some of the top issues that are really important to the Asian American community. We, we intentionally added the issue um, pieces into the survey because it is really important for us to demonstrate to, again, the mainstream political parties and candidates where we stand as a community on critical issues to our community. So once the survey came out, we made a decision to say, well, what do we do with this information that we have? So we made the decision that we would take the top issues that showed up as being critical to the Asian American community and we would turn it into a presidential voter guide. Into a presidential voter guide. So in August, at the presidential town hall, uh, being uh, hosted and sponsored by API Vote and the Asian American Journalists Association, 
And Advancing Justice is really proud to be a partner in, in, the, in the town hall. Um, we're going to make available um, printed copies of the voter guide. But we will also make the voter guide available electronically. And in the electronic version, we will add pages um, that will be very state specific in some key areas. So let me just very briefly share with you what's going to be contained in the voter guide. There's going to be four sections. One section is going to be a snapshot of the Asian American electorate, the same information that Christine has presented, because we think it's really important to have that summarized up front. The second section is going to take the key issues that we found that was critical to the Asian American community, and in one place, we're going to do a very brief summary of what those key issues are, and what the Asian American slant or bent is to those, to those key issues. The third area is the most critical area. Um, we're going to have the two presidential candidates provide their stance on those key issues. So really a presidential voter, uh, voter guide or presidential scorecard. We have already sent out the questionnaires to the two campaigns. We'll wait to hear back from them. If we don't hear back from them, uh, we have a consulting uh, a group that is actually going to go out and grab the information that's available from the candidate's own um, information to put into the voter guide. And we will do a side-by-side -side comparison. And then the last section in the voter guide is we're going to put a little bit of information in there about your voting rights. And in an electronic version, depending on what state you are in, we're going to provide some guidance on um, what the different voting rights are, whether you are a Section 208 or Section 203 state or jurisdiction. Now, why is this so important? It is important because our community, right, the voter guide is intended to provide information to our community. When we talk about civic engagement, right, it's the inside, entire cycle of civic engagement. We can work really hard to get our people to naturalize. We can work really, really hard to get them registered to vote. Yeah. We can work really hard to reduce all the barriers and get them to the polling, even get them into the polling uh, voting booth. But once they get there and they're staring at the ballot, if they don't know what they're looking at, then all the work leading up to that point would have been for nothing, right? And so part of voter education is going to be a really critical piece of the work that we need to collectively be doing moving forward. So the voter guide is intended to be a community education piece to give our people something to look at on the critical issues that are important to us. But an even more important reason for why this voter guide is really important is that we want community members like you to take this voter guide and to take it down the line to town hall meetings and to meetings with your members of Congress, to your local elected officials, to your state elected um, candidates, and we want you to use the voter guide and say, hey, on this issue, this is where the top of your ticket stands. Are you with him or not? On this issue, this is where the top of your ticket stands. Are you with her or not? Because we think it can be a tool not only to educate our community about the presidential candidates, but if they're going to stand at the top of their tickets, then it can become a tool to also question the candidates down the line, right? Down the line in all of our states. So we hope you will join with us. We will be working in partnership with API Vote to make sure that the voter guide again get distributed at the presidential town hall. But we will also have it available electronically uh, to any of you who are, you know, who would like to take advantage of it or use it. Um, again, I just want to uh, um, express a deep appreciation to Christine and her staff, and to all of you who are making the time to be here. You know, as a former um, elected official, now putting that hat on. Um, it is really important for all of us to be part of the process. We do this work because it is so important to make visible the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander voice and our faces. And the work that we're doing is to make that happen. And so for all the showing up that we're doing, we're so few and yet we're here representing our communities. And that is what's going to be really critical moving forward. So let's stand together and let's make a difference. Thank you all so much. Thank you, me. So, you know, 2016 is not just 
about engaging and inspiring the Asian American Pacific Islander voter. What we're hoping to do is actually start and continue to create a pipeline of those who are going to be elected officials and appointed, because we need that up and down um, on the national level, state level, and local level. So our next speaker is Sayu Bujrani, who is the Executive Director for New American Leaders Project. Oh, I brought my wrong, the wrong piece of paper, so maybe I should go get the right piece of paper, or I'll just wing it. Um, I, as, as you were told, I'm Saeed Bojwani at the New American Leaders Project. Our job is to train first and second generation Americans to run for public office and to hold elected officials, particularly those of New American background, accountable to New Americans on policy issues and on representation issues. And I feel a little bit, I was trying to think about the right analogy, but I feel like I'm at a wedding and I'm stealing the bridesmaids to plan another wedding because you might be thinking, that's maybe not the best analogy, but I was trying to think about why do you care today about what's going to be happening in terms of training candidates to run for office. So I thought I'd tell you um, a little story about how I got to start this organization. In 2008, when we were in a similar place waiting to nominate a new presidential candidate uh, at both conventions, um, I was in a room in Washington, D.C. where we were talking about immigration reform and what we were going to need to do to get 270 votes in Congress to pass immigration reform. Now here we are, eight years later, and nothing has really happened on immigration reform, at least nothing meaningful. What I felt when I was in that room is that the problem was not the advocates who were working on immigration reform. It wasn't a problem of our field strategy and our messaging strategy. It was a problem of who we had in office. And the fact that Congress did not look like us, did not look like America, did not understand the experiences of immigrant communities was really the heart of the problem. And that's when I decided to start an organization that would help to change that. As you all know, more than 60% of the people who are in Congress today held local and state office before they got to Congress. So what we are doing is two things. One is building that pipeline to Congress. But even before we get there, we know that in our communities, our city council members, our state legislators, our school board representatives are the ones who are deciding what the environment is like for new Americans. And so what my organization does is train people of all backgrounds, of all new American backgrounds, Asian American, Latino, Arab American, Caribbean American. We accept anyone who will, is willing to identify with the immigrant experience and wants to take that next step in their civic leadership. Again, I think you probably know a lot of this, but let me tell you that although our country is 38% people of color, only 14% of our state legislators are people of color. So there's a huge gap. It's a little bit better when you get to Congress. About 17% of Congress are people of color. But at the state ledge level and at the school board and city council level, there's a huge representation gap. So why does it matter? For one thing, we know from Mimoa's example that you can, if you are a New American, you are more connected to New American communities, more likely to draw them to the polls, more likely to reach new and low propensity voters that our current candidates are not necessarily reaching out to. Once you get into office, you're more likely to understand the experiences of these communities and to fight for them as a legislator. So those are the two of the reasons why it's very, very important that we change not just the face of Congress, but the face of every legislative body around the country. So I encourage you to think about running for office. I encourage you to think about how do we make the presidential ticket look different in 2020 and in 2024 and in 2028 and, on, and beyond that, because what we're hearing from our presidential candidates on both sides of the aisle is very, very, very limited when it comes to issues of diversity and inclusion. And not just getting staff who look like us, but get, responding to issues that we all care about. So our organization, again, is newamericanleaders.org. You can join the mailing list and get information about the work that we're doing around the country. And I just want to tell you that, you know, because we're talking so much about voting, that we have 30 plus candidates 
on the ballot, in particularly in the places we work, in Michigan, New York, Arizona, and California this year. More than 30 people are running for local and state office in those states. One of them just won his city council election in San Jose. He ran against an incumbent. He won by 68 votes a city council seat in the 10th largest city in California. We have Bao Wing, who some of you have heard of, who is an alum of our program, who won the Garden Grove Mayor's Race by 13 votes. So let's not think that a single vote doesn't matter. It matters whether you're inspired by this ticket or disgusted by the other ticket. It matters whether you don't care about presidential politics, but care about who your city council person is and who your state ledge is. So think about that. Think about all those people who are telling you that they're not excited about the presidential election. Think about how you can get them to vote by saying that maybe their vote might not matter as much at the top of the ticket, but it does matter when it comes to the person who you're going to inter interact with more, more than likely in terms of issues that affect your kids, your families, and you yourself when it comes to workplace issues, education, and health. So with that, again, New American Leaders Project, uh, please consider running for office because it's really the only way we're going to change the conversation. Thank you. Here this, uh, for the next hour or two. So if you have specific questions, we encourage you to go ahead and go up to them. Hopefully, uh, many of you who want to run for office or even thinking about it will be mobbing Sayu uh, in a little bit. Um, but please continue to um, stay around. More food is actually coming out right now, and the bars will be opened. Um, we will uh, resume the program around 3, 3.30 when Constance Wu from Fresh Off the Boat, a few of VIPs from the Hillary campaign will also be stopping by, and members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. So at that time, we will go ahead and resume. In the meanwhile, we will also strike up the band and get the music um, going as well. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, for those of you, um, please stop by and grab one of our multilingual buns and uh, t-shirts, they're for sale. Um, it is to actually fund our Youth Vote campaign, so your, all, all your money is actually going to the great cause. Thank you.